a chance. Oh, wait a minute. If you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain If you like having your boat out If you like to get brain If you love making love at midnight And sucking off all your friends If you eat out at Wendy's Come with me and in my bands There we go If you like penis colossus in your mouth or your butt, come with me and we'll have some, and you will get a nut. If you like getting sucked at midnight, let me bust in your face. I'm sorry, this is a family stream. That's really awful. I shouldn't say that. Crap, I forgot to repost this thing. Right, let me, hold on a minute. I gotta repost this thing here. Ah, bubble ball. Pardon me, I'm just finagling. Alright, that ought, that ought to do it, right? Yeah, that'll be fine. You can hear me, right? Turn the volume up a little bit. That ought to do it. Uh, Alright, yeah, I'm sorry about the E4 thing on yesterday. It just, we could not get it to work. We could not get the stream to go... The, like the OBS thing to process the goddamn thing. I don't know why it was Chris doing it. I trust that he did everything he could. So sorry about that. Maybe we can make it work after the tour. I don't know. <sighs> okay, hi folks. So we can't sadly do Universal Universalis. Although honestly, I was kind of wondering what I'd even be able to do. Because just looking at the screen made me feel overwhelmed. But what we can do is we can talk about the next two chapters of this here book, First Class Passengers on a Sinking Ship by Richard Lachman, about the last two countries to make a stab, a successful stab, in Lachman's opinion, which is not shared by all, uh, at hegemony before declining and being replaced by another hegemon. Those being the Dutch Republic, those delightful freaks, those mayonnaise-eating swamp Germans with their hilariously made-up language, which is, it's absurdly precisely halfway between German and English. It's like a joke language. Like if you were going to make up a, a, a joke language between those two countries, what would it sound like? It would be Dutch. But anyway. So those freaks had a short moment in the sun as a global hegemon setting the terms after the decline of the failed attempted hegemony uh, made by the Spanish Habsburgs and uh, before the French had their failed attempt. Or I, I guess simultaneously. Uh, yeah, the go Dutch Golden Age runs at about the same time that the French are making a play for continental hegemony, but... Uh, if they were going to get it, they would have taken it from the Dutch in the late 17, in the late 1800s. I'm sorry, in the late 17th century, 16, late 1600s, because the Dutch Golden Age starts uh, winding down in the latter decades of the 17th century. Uh, the Peace of Westphalia actually ended up kind of kicking their ass. Uh, peace was uh, was was the engine of uh, the sort of the elite consensus uh, that had powered 
uh, them to that point of hegemony. And then once they get peace, they're kind of fucked. And then they fight the British, and they lose, even though they have more money than the British. And that's when Louis the... Uh, Louis the Fourteenth is trying to make his stab and failing before the British take it up. So we get failed Spaniards, then the Dutch actually achieve a short hegemony. They falter. Britain and France vie for it. The French, the British take it pretty conclusively at uh, after the Seven Years' War. That's the end. That's the that's the eclipse of France until you have the brief explosion under Napoleon when they you know, are able to create a modern state sort of almost overnight that is able to make up for their uh, relatively backward colonial position by just wiping out elite conflict completely with a fucking guillotine. But that was because it was a conquest regime, not the kind of commercial, consensual empire. Yes, uh, certainly also coerced, but not only coerced or not largely coerced. The problem for the Napoleonic style of, of uh, empire is that you cannot get sufficient buy-in from local elites to make, to make governing it a winning proposition. In the long term, they will eventually revolt because they're not seeing enough money because it's all being hoovered up into the metropole because it has to be sent back to the provinces in the form of pay for your administrators, for your civil and military administrators. Whereas the... Uh, consensual empires are able to enlist local elites, get them on board because they are cut in essentially on, uh, on the deal. Of course, at the bottom, you're getting a pointy end of the bayonet no matter what, but uh, with more elite buy-in, you have a more stable uh, civil order that means it's cheaper to administer, which means you get more money out of your colonies. And that meant that in the long run, if a, if a, if a, if a conquest regime like, uh, like Napoleon's France or Germany's, uh, Hitler's Germany later, once you can no longer expand, you're fucked. If you can no longer, if there's no horizon, you're fucked. Whereas a capitalist hegemony can extend that horizon artificially. Whereas the, the conquest regime is mired in the need to dominate a finite space that will not allow for infinite uh, conquest. And you're not even get with with uh, formal conquest. You don't even have to wait to to get to the edge of the the globe to run out of room. You'll run out well earlier than that because of the amount of friction with other polities and within the ones you've dominated that is going to acu accumulate. All right. So last we met the book, the Spaniards, because they have this uh, aristocratic autarky rule where you have a dynasty on top trying to create a centralized state, but having to contend with localized authority that is essentially independent and then is only able to reproduce that relationship in its colonial holdings. So you have a bunch of independent landowners, independent aristocrats who will send back as much tribute to Spain as they feel like they need to to avoid uh, too much hassle. The rest, they will keep to themselves. They will send out uh, into the trade networks of rival powers. They just bled out as they were trying to fill their empire because the, the hose was leaky, basically. Uh, and it just kept getting leakier as uh, the power in the colonies increased, as American elites became more influential back in Spain. So when the Dutch, who started off as a rebellious province of the Habsburg Spanish Empire, this is the amazing thing, they're a fraction of the Spanish holdings, but what they were was, they were the most economically fertile, the most uh, urbanized part of their empire, which meant that they were going to be able to uh, create local regimes of uh, administrative capacity, that and 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 just uh, sheer engineering ability uh increased efficiency of operations that your big lumbering empire cannot contend with so eventually not only did they break away uh and they were hegemonic in the process of fighting spain like that's when the dutch, dutch golden age really begins after the because uh the truce the, tw the 12 years truce and the 80 years war between spain and holland that went from 1609 to 16 uh 
21, is the space where the Dutch were able to establish. They, were, they got the breathing room on the seaways of the world where previously they'd been fighting uh, against the Spanish. They gave them the breathing room to turn their nascent colonial holdings that they had built up in an attempt to, you know, get around Habsburg rule. They were able to turn those into durable sources of uh, economic activity. They were able to create networks that brought incredibly valuable global spices and resources to, to the Netherlands, where it was able to be turned into capital. And then they used that capital during the second half of the Eight Years' War, which coincided with the second two-thirds, or uh, which coincides almost completely with the Thirty Years' War. Uh, both ended with the Treaty of Westphalia in 18, 1648. Uh, by the end of that, they had established a genuine uh, hegemonic relationship to the other mercantile empires competing in Europe. But it didn't last more than 20 years after that. Why? Now, first we have to say, why did the Sp why did Netherlands, why was Netherlands able to build a capacity for hegemony? And uh, we look here, we find the same answer as we found in Spain. In Spain, there could be no hegemony, hegemony because the polity of the Spanish, Emp of Spain, of the Iberian Union, uh, was made up of these uh, local orders of aristocratic military rule that had been the people who had fought off the Moors, who had kicked the infidel uh, Muslims out of Spain, and in so doing had established firm legal tenure over the lands in their domains. Ten that means uh, legal control of the, of the output of their peasants and of the legal system that uh, their citizens in the countryside and in the nascent small cities, Spain did not have, it was not industrialized. I, I'm sorry, Spain was not urbanized nearly to the degree that the low countries were. Uh, at this point, because nobody was, you know, this is before you really see the post-Black Death explosion. That's because people think of the, uh, the uh, Reconquista as this, as this thing that happens in uh, 1498 or 1492. It is a 300-year-long process, and that over the course of it, these military orders come up, kick out parts of uh, Spanish, or uh, overthrow sultans and emirs, replace them with their own regimes of power over everything. And that meant that when it was time to try to create a dynamic modern state, those power centers were there to resist it for their own individual interests. As opposed, now, you have a bit, essentially the opposite situation in the low countries, in the very, the, 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 the place that would be the Netherlands, uh, essentially has no real aristocracy after the fall of the, the Charlemagne dynasty, the original uh, Holy Roman Empire that encompassed uh, Northern Italy and France, as well as Germany, uh, the one that collapsed almost immediately as soon as uh, Charlemagne's kids started fighting over, over fighting with one another. The first thing to go was was uh, was the, that area, and uh, it was never really rep uh, it was only ever lightly governed by uh, uh, independent counts. Uh, the peasantry were essentially free. There was there were very few feudal uh, obligations uh, that they owed to their uh, you know their counts. And, which were almost entirely in the form of like a yearly uh, tithes. Just the old, you know, the, the, the feudal thing of like, you know, you owe me X amount of uh, your barley or whatever the fuck for the year. But no labor requirements, which was a huge part of feudalism, was labor obligations. Like two weeks a, uh, two weeks a, mo a month, or I'm sorry, you know, like a National Guard service, like, you know, one weekend uh, a month and then two weeks a year, you got to work on my on the, the Lord's property, the Lord's private property and then you provide free labor so that they could have their own agricultural surplus that they don't have to put a fucking finger on it is done by, as contribute contribute contribution labor from uh the local peasantry which is enforced by a legal system which is controlled by the aristocracy uh on, only on top of that is like a later larger uh dynastic royal authority in place that never existed in the netherlands 
the, the peasants at most owed some uh, either rent or uh, some of their surplus to their alleged uh, uh, lord. They were not enmeshed in a feudal relationship with him. And part of that is because of how um, labor, how capital intensive making that part of Europe profitable as an agricultural uh, endeavor was because it was a bunch of fucking marshland. It was a goddamn lagoon, basically. It was a swamp. And the thing about a swamp is you can make it fertile, but it requires fucking putting money in. And if there's one thing that uh, the spendthrift aristocrats of Europe, whose entire economic, their, their entire role in the economy was to consume, not to reinvest as under, cap, under capitalism, but to consume. They're not going to fucking uh, spend a lot of money to build uh, dikes and windmills. Are you fucking kidding me? Just, I'll just, I can sit in my fucking castle and sometimes like fight my cousins for entertainment and, and, and go to balls and listen to, balls, balls, listen to uh, brass band music, have my little jester dance for me. I don't need to worry about like, uh, oh, what? Like we got to supervise putting in the fucking uh, dikes. We, you, we got to design it. You want me to tell you uh, like what shape the fan blades of the windmill should be? That is a pain in my ass. And I don't need it because whatever you guys make, I get a portion of it. The only people who were motivated to do the work of clearing that land, of create, putting up the dike systems that could irrigate it, that could power uh, uh, mills with wind were the peasants. So uh, the infrastructure of the Low Countries was built by peasant communities, that, like uh, essentially cooperatives, uh, that where people pitched in their own labor instead of giving it as tribute to their overseer, their own labor to the project of building a dam, building a, a windmill. What that means is that when, uh, first of all, when Spain tries to impose a greater tax burden on these independent burghers, because what happens when this occurs is it brings people into cities and all of a sudden these farmers are moving into cities and you have these, these dense urban agglomerations where consumption happens. Because if you're in the city, you're not growing your own food. You're not making your own clothing. And that creates mar demand, demand that can be filled. And it also uh, gets people together to figure out things like how to build better fucking uh, fishing boats so that Dutch, mer uh, Dutch fishing fleets can trap more goddamn fish than anybody and have more surplus from the sale of the fish, allowing more and more land in the Netherlands to go towards creation of consumables, uh, not, not directly as food, but as uh, elements of a greater consumer economy, things that go into clothing, things that go into... Uh, uh, stained glass windows or, or little dancing puppets, whatever the fuck. All the economic activity that comes from getting a bunch of people together. And that creates this new independent urban elite. Never part of the uh, aristocratic structure. The aristocrats, the few that there were, were getting, uh, are uh, giving each other head injuries in their castles and sitting on their... Uh, sufficient if uh tribute like if they really want more they'll help go get more territory and if they if they try and fail they get killed and then somebody else takes over the logic is always the same among the aristocrats i'm not investing any money anywhere you give me what you have and if it's not enough we take over other people's it's, it's the robber baron logic that that is at the heart of the military bandit class that ascended after the fall of the roman empire to, to, uh, to assert some level of uh, security at the base level to allow for commerce. So that means you've got these independent city folk, literate ones, who have, they hear about, about the same time that the, the Spanish are turning on the screws and demanding more in taxes and demanding more administrative control over these self-governing cities, this is not like a traditional aristocratic over, uh, class. This is a foreign uh, aristocracy because there is no local aristocracy. They've been overthrown. You've got the House of Orange and a few other guys. That's it. 
in the in the in the poorer provinces, because remember, it's twelve provinces that end up getting independent at first. Uh, they get more later, but they are not all equally rich. They don't and are not all equally urbanized. Some of them become places that contribute agriculturally to cities that are in other provinces, namely Amsterdam, the big one, the heart, the the the, the city that is essentially. The other day, too big compared to everything else in the Netherlands to allow for hegemony to be established and not so quickly undermined. So they're getting Martin Luther and John Calvin and all these sto- and all this and and, this, and the Geneva Psalter giving them a culture of religious resistance to the Catholicism that undergirds the uh, Habsburg monarchy at the same time that they are becoming independent uh, economic actors. So, of course, they revolt, and they're able to successfully fight off, at least in the north, a big this army. And it's because you have a unified elite who have a... Uh, who are able to align their interests around the central goal of getting independence. And what's this? The way to get independence? Build a durable commercial empire. And though they cre- do things, like they create the Dutch East India Company. And they, and, and they create uh, then later the West India Company. And now, these are not sis- this is not sending out a bunch of uh, 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 pirates to just grab something and then say it's theirs and then like, just write, basically have them uh, buy a piece of paper from the king that says they own it and then lets them do whatever they want. These are administrative bodies. They are not technically part of the dynasty. Or, I mean, they're not technically, like, state-owned. But they're staffed with the members of a single class of, of largely Amsterdam merchants. And so it is through that... It is with that end in mind, that unified end, that they carry out their colonial endeavors. And they're so much more successful than Spain is at getting money back to the metropole because there's no independent power accruing here. And that's how they're able to build this, this, this dynamo. And that's why they're the kings of the slave trade. And then eventually the, 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 the Spanish have to piggyback on, and at first the British do too, have to piggyback on Dutch trade networks in order to get anything out of their colonies. But, oh, so what's interesting, though, is that eventually they get these things built, but then the, the cost of war begins to overwhelm the benefits coming uh, from the, the expansion to fight it. And the Dutch burghers who are paying the vast majority of the cost of the war. Holland and Amsterdam in particular are the, by far, the most heavy contributors to the state coffers. Everybody else is, is essentially free riding on the Dutch, uh, econ- or on the, uh, the Holland economy. But those places are filled, those, those places where they're making like uh, produce and agriculture, they benefit from high wartime prices. They actually uh, have a vested interest in seeing the war continue forever. But they're losing money in the, in the merchant capitals. And so in the face of a, a resistance from guys like uh, uh, the House of Orange, who are the military heads of the effort, because none of these burghers could uh, marshal that kind of authority. That kind of authority did still reside in the, 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 the aristocracy that they did have, that passed for an aristocracy, native aristocracy in the Netherlands. And that was mainly the House of Orange, disproportionately the House of Orange, compared uh, in a way that isn't true in other uh, dynasties where you had a much greater competition of, of large dynastic families, big houses in uh, Gambo terms, great houses rather. And so there's this material interest split on the question of the war. The Dutch, the, uh, the, the Amsterdam merchants get their way and there is a, a a, um, there is a uh, truce, but their whole time during the truce, there is this political war over whether to uh, extend it or end it and go back to war with the Spain. 
and it becomes expressed as a religious war between people who are hardcore Calvinists and those are the war party, the people who are making who made more money uh, uh, selling their uh, agricultural products under the war conditions, people who were refugees from the southern Netherlands who wanted their uh, their property back and could only get it if they were reclaimed or liberated or however you wanted to put it. And then you had the Amsterdam merchants who just didn't want to fucking pay any more money and were happy to see uh, the, uh, these thriving net, the commercial networks being able to be uh, butt up unmolested in peacetime conditions. And they are the ones who support this guy, Arminius, who says, actually, you know what? Maybe uh, it's not predestination. Maybe God isn't such a sadistic monster that he dooms people to eternity in hellfire before they are born. Like, that is basically burning ants with a fucking magnifying glass. If God is good, God does not do that. And that becomes this alternative Calvinism. And they go to war, and uh, eventually the war party wins uh, because... Uh, the military power of the Stadtholder is able to essentially repopulate the, the, uh, the judiciary with members of the war party because of their uh, wartime powers. Uh, and that leads to the leading uh, Arminians getting executed, including John Van Oldenbarvelt, who is the head of the, 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 the peace party. And it's, and it's, and it's uh, declared... By the Synod of Dort, it's declared um, heretical, and, and Calvinism is affirmed. Now that doctrine, that alternative understanding of grace uh, and free will, ends up being the uh, kernel of Methodism later, which is, ends up basically swamping Calvinism in America, because conditions get different. Conditions get better, basically, uh, because we're in America and we're able to secularly satisfy a lot of the stuff that we used to have to satisfy spiritually and intellectually. So we can make do with Methodism. Uh, and I think that that is the split in the bourgeois psyche that ends up emerging is between the Calvinists, the God's will is wrought by deed. Uh, uh, those who suffer are suffer at his command. Those who prosper, prosper at his command. That is the, that's the pointy end of capitalism. That, that, that's the people who were slave owners and who now are small business owners. And the other one, the Arminianism, that is the Christianity of the soft-handed merchants who don't have to extract because they live in the, uh, they don't have to extract because they live in the abstract realm of exchange where all the violence is done elsewhere. They have been temporally and spatially fixed away from it. So they could have this fantasy that they're good people and, the, and, the, and God is, uh, is judging their works as they live, which is otherwise an unsustainable belief under capitalism. The Dutch invented the slave trade, basically. The whole time they're having this fight, they are literally inventing the slave trade. But as soon as they create this new uniform... So, the, for a minute, for, the, for a while, the, uh, the burghers of Amsterdam are sort of overthrown. The war starts up again. But Dutch uh, uh, economic fortunes are still great because they've built this machine that is so much more effective than what the rickety-ass Spanish can put together, even though they can draw on theoretically more resources. Eventually, they become the entrepot of Europe. Amsterdam is, is the... Uh, the uh, finance capital of Europe. The war ends. The burghers naturally solidify power. And this is where you're doomed. Because Bachmann's entire thesis, Lachman's entire thesis here is that the, the specific arrangement of forces in elite relations, the, the specific alignment of elite forces that can create hegemony uh, cannot sustain it because... Having hegemony creates new challenges, new challenge, uh, uh, new challenges, new conditions that that fixed uh, relationship of elites cannot address, and so therefore, it uh, it, it declines because Lachman is, is really does believe something that I do too that you cannot really have a reform from within a given hegemonic uh, elite structure. It has to just destroy itself. Because it has complete command. If it didn't, it wouldn't be hegemonic. 
that's scary because a lot of us imagine revolution as this salvation from below, but only under conditions of collapse that have already been created by that failure of the elite structure to adapt can you have uh, a revolutionary situation, which means you cannot avoid the disaster. You cannot avoid the emergency. You cannot avoid the horror. See, somebody says the Calvinist response to the frying of the magnifying glasses thing is that whatever God does is inherently good. Uh, if God, God's, God does not get to decide what's good. God's goodness cannot be different than human goodness because that assumes a universal, unbridgeable distance between people and God. And the entire point of religion, I thought, was to bridge that gap. Calvinists reify it into an eternal, abstract reality. You can logic your way into saying, and that's what Calvinism is, it's a logic game, it's replacing the rosary, it replaces the physical rosary with this intellectual rosary. Instead of feeling God in your hand, you're supposed to make him real in your head. Logically, rationally. Reconvince yourself, because you can't feel it anymore. You can't feel it. You can roll those fucking things, but they just feel like wood. You can't feel it, so you have to think it. And so that means you have to make God essentially into a rational human mind. But rational human mind is a is a, is a construct, a expression of a greater total truth that is called God. And that is, I think, the only real thing that you can... The only real blasphemy is the blasphemy against that. And that's what the horror that we live in, is that we are trapped in a religious tradition that because of its need to dot, create and sustain class rule has now enshrined in the hearts of almost all living beings, a heretical view of God as a separate thing. And people walk around thinking that, 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 that they're honoring God when in fact they're creating an idol by needing it to fulfill... Needing God to fit in your box, that is the horror of the, of, the, uh, of the Christian tradition specifically. Others are like this too in their own way, but I don't know them as well. But the, the, uh, the tradition of saying that uh, uh, we have to justify faith logically. And the thing is, you only have to do that as a not as a theoretical, not as a spiritual or theological problem, as a practical consideration of the persistence of class rule. Because we should not have to justify God logically if we felt God in our interactions with one another. If we lived in a community without exploitation, without what's the big A, alienation, the snake in the garden, if we did not have somebody taking someone else's fucking sweat right in front of them and then having to call it good, there would be no need to justify God as an abstract concept. What would you need that for? You need to do that because you're, the world you see calls God one thing and the people whose name, people say the name while striking down their fellow fucking man. How the hell are you supposed to believe in God in that situation? We better prove it to you. Like We just stopped feeling God because we were no longer able to 
sustain the fiction, the social fiction, that that the that 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 God like was a force in our lives. It would have to be something that we have to call towards ritually, inscribe ritually. Rituals. The the, the only difference in Catholics and Protestants is the refinement of the ritual away from actual acts like carnivals and and masses and and eucharist and sacraments and a book symbols on a page that you look at and think about and those were the dutch the kings of that they spread across the globe but what they did in doing that was they created a fixed new hierarchy that was not going to be able to adapt when the conditions changed. When, for mainly, when the British created their own structure that was capable of doing the same thing the Dutch were and started competing with them on a relatively equal footing. As soon as that happened, uh, the Dutch were required to, to change things, to change the, compos- the, the, the general thrust of their, uh, of their political economic engine. But because the uh, families that had created the Dutch East India Company, the Dutch West India, the West India Company, had written it into the contracts of the founding of the fucking companies that their families would control their seats forever, trying to create essentially a new aristocracy within the commercial economy, it meant that if uh, fighting the British, hey, we actually, uh, we need to increase military spending here if we're going to actually compete with the British. We might not have to, like, you know, build more ships. We might have to invest more. Uh, the Amsterdam burgers, uh, no, uh, we want low taxes, please. Low taxes, please. And they had the ability to veto anything because the, the, the uh, United Provinces, the Dutch Republic, allowed any province to veto any uh, proposal. And so Amsterdam had essentially a veto over every policy, which meant that they could not adjust. And they got their fucking asses ate. Now, when the French go for it, Louis XIV tries to take over Spain at the War of the Spanish Succession, invades the Holy Roman Empire, go, gives it a shot, but he didn't realize that the game was not going to be won or lost in Europe. It was going to be won and lost in the colonies. And the French, just as we talked about for other reasons, and we talked about in previous uh, chapters, they did not have the capacity to, uh, to really compete colonially. Who did? The motherfucking British. Who come in and create the longest yet durable hegemony of the capitalist era. About 100 years. Although, again, some people disagree... Some people say the British never actually held hegemony. Uh, if you define hegemony as more, you have a greater put out on any given axis, like you have a bigger army than the next two uh, rivals, or you have a bigger uh, uh, manufacturing sector than the next two rivals. And the two rival standard, the British barely ever uh, dominated anything during that whole period. But I think if you take hegemony to mean setting the rules for a global trade network, which I think is makes sense, and definitely is the way that the United States could be defined as a hegemony, uh, then I think that this is a good standard, and, uh, and the British certainly, for that 19th century, really, uh, they had it. They held it. And part of the reason is, is that after 1688, the Glorious Revolution, where the uh, British commercial bourgeois that had struggling, that had been so powerful, that had been able to punch through uh, the... the dynastic system in the 1640s kill a fucking king but could not stabilize a uh, a non-monarchial uh, uh, structure to negotiate elite conflict which is what a government is they couldn't build a new leviathan so uh, they had to have cromwell step in to fill the gap and then they brought back the stuarts and james ii went catholic which was essentially the second version of the stuarts trying to fight what was coming, which was the overthrow of the uh, dynastic ruling family 
and, and, and its position atop this um, uh, this this post feudal uh, aristocratic military order that's falling apart that can't compete with the dynamic center of uh, capital in the cities. And it's, again, defined religiously, Catholics versus Protestants this time, but again, on top of the same basic interest structures. And uh, they literally import a Dutch king to come in and have him agree, after basically a job interview, to rule as uh, a reduced sovereign who would essentially be there as a backstop and uh, mainly just as a avatar of process, a ritual reaffirmation of like the uh, agreed upon rule set that the bourgeois, the rising bourgeois, we're going to use to govern in parliament. And so that means that like the Dutch, the British are able to create these uh, companies, these chartered companies like the East India Company, and allow them to, acting as independent con uh, uh, corporate entities, but connected to uh, the British state, and crucially, required to provide a vast amount of, uh, of rents and loans to the British state. That was the condition of the East India Company and the other companies being chartered. Is you're kicking back a shit ton of this money to uh, to old John Bull, and they were able to create a uh, a structure that was capable of busting open India and turning it into this massive cash cow, with the money being directed towards this this new uh, center. Uh, and because, again, this is a staffed bureaucracy and not a bunch of independent freebooting would-be uh, failing aristocrats and, like, up-jumped uh, uh, buccaneers, like in Spain, uh, their employees, they are able to be uh, uh, constrained in their ability to operate independently of uh, the metropole, except, or, uh, and they are able to exercise though individual initiative this is the crucial thing but and that any individual initiative pulled the british state deeper and deeper into india probably against its own wishes but in so doing without anyone knowing it building these like roots that would end up taking hold and creating this insane money or uh, capital machine that just pulls estimates of tr trillions of dollars i believe 45 trillion dollars is the estimate and amount of wealth taken from India uh, during, the, uh, during the East India era and the Raj afterwards. But instead of that action creating independent power, power bases, what it really did was it built an incredibly robust British state and bureaucracy that when the time came, when the East India Company was cutting too many quarters, pissing off too many natives, doing something like revoke, provoking the uh, great uh, Indian mutiny, the Sepoy Rebellion, as they used to call it, uh, in, 16, in uh, 1857, they were able to just nationalize the motherfucker. Unlike in the Netherlands, where the, those companies operated as these independent fiefdoms their entire existence because the, the burghers could veto. Uh, the more... Um, uh, all the money coming into England created a unified elite bloc in England that was able to exercise influence through Parliament. The interests of rural landowners and industrialists and uh, commercial uh, merchants and financiers all c came together around extracting resources from the colonies, domestically manufacturing products in England and then distributing them to uh, both uh, a... a well-established internal market and also uh, to, uh, through the rest of its um, uh, colonial holdings. That was a state capable of just having a vote and saying, yeah, East India Company, uh, that's now, the, that's now uh, a, Briti a arm of the British uh, State Department. Because... The big, the big money thing that people had were not shares in the East India Company, although plenty of people did. Uh, it was shares of government debt. 
It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was corporate bonds. It was stocks. So they are able to um, absorb the East India Company and create the Belle Epoque of England, the, the, the Victorian era when they were the, the dominant force on the planet. Uh, and, uh, the proof, I would say, the ultimate proof that the British, the English in the 19th century were absolutely hegemonic in a way that the United States later became is that one of the most important contributing factor, factors to the failure of Reconstruction had nothing to do with armed resistance by racist whites in the South, uh, uh, the, Johnson, the, the disastrous Johnson administration, uh, uh, corruption, or anything else. It was the goddamn gold standard, which was imposed by the city of London on the rest of the world. If the United States did not want to get completely fucked in its trade with the British... And the British were their number one trade ally after, or uh, number one trade partner had been since the revolution because who else was there to trade with? Nobody else had the networks. Like the fucking Jacksonian, De the Jeffersonian Democrats hated that the Federalists wanted to trade with their old enemy. But the Federalists, even though they were a bunch of fucking stiff-necked aristocrats, at least recognized that the British were the actual ones who were buying stuff. So the U.S., if it wanted to maintain a decent trade with Britain and not end up having its its inf its uh, currency inflated away in value by a run on its money, it had to stay on the, the gold standard. Now, it didn't have to, and I think there was a politics, a greenback politics that guys like Benjamin Butler represented that could have fended off that, but it would have required the full emancipation of... Uh, southern slaves instead of the failed attempt to do so that right reconstruction became but one of the things that made that sh made that made that thing inevitable was that in a context where uh there was great resistance to the imposition of reconstruction there was basically an incapacity at the federal government level to deal with economic conditions by increasing people's uh livelihoods the entire period was this deflationary era when these cyclical panics would destroy the economy and then there would be no federal aid possible because there could be no uh, debt uh, run up. There could be, you could not just print more money. So that's how, and that's, and that was a decision not made in DC, although the majority of people in both parties wanted it that way because they were creatures of American capital, which was essentially a uh, symbiotic creature connected to British finance capital. But it could have been fought from below, but we didn't get a, we didn't get a real fight against it, sadly. But that's a hegemonic motherfucking uh, power. I get to this. But that's only India. The other thing you have is the settler colonies. North America, uh, uh, Oceania. Those are where the problem comes in. That is where your hegemony gets fucked. Because you get the same contradiction emerging that fucked up the Spaniards, which is independent power accruing in the colonies. Now, the place where independent power accrued the most broke off the United States. The other places did not have sufficient to resist uh, fully uh, British power, but they still had a capacity to extract um, concessions. And you see in those other countries a willingness after the U.S. is lost to uh, uh, accede to, to concessions. Largely because the British throttled America the way they did, in part because they didn't think they could afford to lose the revenues they were getting there. They couldn't afford uh, to uh, 
bleed out to the U.S. developing its own independent trade networks uh, because it did not have anything else to back that up. Uh, it's, it, it was still nascently in India. When the other uh, settler colonies start acting up, India had been well established then as a huge money winner, a huge, uh, a huge resource. Uh, like the American cotton could be replaced by Indian cotton. Uh, uh, slave labor in the Caribbean could be literally imported from uh, India. So you could give the colonists more of what they wanted. You could give them more leeway. And the other thing what making them want to get more leeway is that eventually this independent uh, ruling elite, or uh, this, this united ruling elite, which again, it's composed of everybody. Most of the old aristocrats who were landowners, they bought themselves into the finance economy. The, 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 uh, the manufacturers had... The merchants had, everybody had bought into the financial economy, so they had all settled around a common interest, around free trade and a strong pound, which means weak public investment. Free trade and a strong pound means you can't print money. It means you make money for capitalists through profit, but you cannot return it to anybody who made it. Now, that's fine in the colonies because they don't count. They're out of your, uh, your, your social structure. But they will still resist. And they'll resist everywhere where they feel that they're being squeezed this way. And the states has an interest in being able to deal with that. But what stops them from being able to is that these independent settler colonial elites are able to demand things like their own tariffs to build up their own domestic industries, which fucks British manufacturing, which you need. You can't cut out the heart of manufacturing or else your financialized economy will eventually blow away in the wind of fluctuating uh, uh, macro conditions, which is exactly what happened to the English. They could, they were, they stopped their, their dyna the dynamic uh, unifying elite that went out and conquered became completely resistant to actually paying for a fucking empire. Like, Niall Ferguson claims that uh, the British had this like full commitment to empire that they imposed through like this culture of duty or whatever the fuck. Every British aristo and, uh, and merchant and, and, sh and shop owner, uh, anybody with a, a, a piece of stock with their name on it, spent the entire British Empire era bitching about how much it cost. And they were paying an incredibly low rate. I, they, they, they didn't... There was a doubling of the tax rate uh, after reform finally kicks in that takes the top tax rate to like 7.4%. And that was doubling the previous uh, amount. And they have the ability, because of that control of Parliament to shoot down the sort of investment in an actual military that could allow you to defend an empire instead of eventually give away so much to these peripheral elites that you're essentially competing with them. And so that means that by the time the Americans and the Germans catch up in the late 1800s, they're manufacturing... Uh, base is collapsing. Let me read some crazy shit about, uh, about uh, how, how, how quickly British manufacturing collapsed at the very end of the 19th century. Let me see if I can find this. But this thing, like, it created this insane wealth, just, just huge jump of wealth at the top. It also raised wages, which is what minimized domestic, uh, like the domestic uh, uh, labor war. Like that, that's a big reason that uh, Britain never really developed a de I mean, they got a labor party, but they never really developed a meaningful, uh, I mean, I remember like Lenin, Lenin, for example, was like, the, the British aren't going to do it. And a big reason for that is that that empire did have spoils and raise, wages went up 
And the ability to do a thing like go be a colonial officer or go make it into one of the colonies was a live option that diffused a lot of social conflict. But eventually, by the 18, late 1800s, not only are they having to fight like other white people, which means you can't use colonial troops. Many, most of the wars fought in the 19th century were with colonial troops, Indians mostly. So they could get killed all the time and it wouldn't matter. But then you get the Boer War, where you can't have, you can't have uh, uh, Indians getting used to killing white men. So you got to use all white guys, and that pisses people off. And it costs a lot of money. They want to spend uh, less of it. But the reason that this, uh, your manufacturing gets killed is that um, bank consolidation sucks all the money out of the local economies into foreign investments because that's where the highest rate of return is. Nobody wants to invest in local businesses. So that means that local manufacturers, which is most of them, don't consolidate. They don't get the um, influx of credit that they got in North, um, North America and in Germany, which is an industrial policy. That can't be carried out in England with, with the desire of the, of, the, of the financier is, is the desire of the ruling class uni, in, uni, in dominance, if not unison. And so they say, no dice. So that means that local manufacturing falls behind. It doesn't consolidate. It doesn't get the, the, uh, the competitive advantages that the consolidating manufacturing sectors of, of North America and Germany get. And it starts falling behind. Let me find this goddamn fucking... I should have marked it. Okay, here it is. No, that... Oh, fuck, I'm so stupid. I'm sorry. I, I get, please... Keep staring at my bald spot. What the fuck is this? I might have to give up. I'm a fucking idiot. Suffice it to say, in the late 19th century, uh, the uh, English British manufacturing output is absolutely collapsing, uh, which means that they're losing on a bunch of other axes, including militarily. Which means when the big war comes, uh, they're fucked, and they turn into decline. And then who's there to pick up the ball? People who are able to take all of those. Uh, who were able to, at a later date, consolidate a different and more dynamic set of elite interests into one unified elite interest. But, you know, because there are fewer resources and we finally hit a global maximum, the uh, time before a crisis emerges and something has to change is much shorter, which means decline sets in even faster. And we are now in the decline phase because we have an elite that cannot be challenged from without. All of their interests are arrayed against one another. Or all of their interests are arrayed against a general interest. Because they have created structures that give them the ability to overrule. They used to have a unified interest with the state. So they could together steer it. But now the state has an interest in like taking their money. The state has an interest in breaking their political power. The state has an interest in radically reducing their share of, of profits. But they build structures that ensure that that is the one thing the system can't do. It's like how RoboCop can't kill anybody who works for OCP. Like, yeah, if they're unified, they're unified in resistance to any centralizing uh, oversight. Now, they all think it's for their own reasons, but they, they are all still motivated collectively in that direction. And even there, though there are sectors and specific power structures that aren't, they get swamped.
Now the question is, what happens next? Like, the decline of these previous hegemons is relative. They don't stop being powers. They don't stop having uh, economies that make a lot of money for their elites. They don't stop having a functioning political economy and, and social structure. They're just no longer in the driver's seat. The difference now is that America decline does not appear to offer a viable alternative. China is the one everyone talks about, where, again, elites have emerged later to deal with some of those problems. Oh, the Chinese actually can, where they need to expropriate. They're not, they're not programmed to not be able to expropriate. But I, the problem I see with that is that the, the, the structural problems we have are so deep that they go beyond uh, uh, simply redistributing on top of a, a, a capitalist political economy. Because we're exacerbating with every action the crisis conditions more than any human action can address them. We're behind the eight ball. All right, here it is. Fuck. All right. Britain's international investments and the ease with which British investment firms facilitated the transfer of capital around the world helped firms in other countries borrow the money needed for industrialization, which then made competitors for British industry. This led to a boom in industrial production worldwide, but a decline in profits which hit the less efficient, older British firms harder than newer, technologically advanced, and vertically integrated American and German corporations. Does anyone, does this sound familiar to anybody? Mann, he's a scholar on these subjects, who defines hegemony as exceeding the next two powers combined, finds that Britain met that standard for industrial production between 1860 and 1880. On a per capita basis, its industrial production was more than double the next two powers. From the 1830s to the 1880s, Britain still retained first rank in the 1900. Um, all right, sorry. On a per capita basis, its industrial production was more than double the next two partners from the 1830s to the 1880s. Britain still retained first rank in 1900, falling behind the United States by 1913, by which time total U.S. industrial production was 250% of Britain's and Germany had surpassed Britain. Britain accounted for a third of world industrial output in 1870 and a seventh in 1913. It produced a third of world seal in the late 1870s and a tenth in 1909 to 1913, when Germany produced twice as much and the United States quadrupled British output. Chronic trade, de uh, chronic trade deficits were clear indicators of Britain's declining position in the world economy. Now, that's a problem that we don't really have. That's only marginally ours because we took financialization farther than the British could have possibly done it because of technological innovations. But we are still in a general downward trajectory because of an inability to maintain a domestic real economy. Because there are knock-on effects of that, one of which is uh, there's somebody other than uh, uh, these freak elites able to exercise political power. There's another thing that is able to sit at an elite table, but is not composed of actual elites. Only, uh, I guess you'd call them labor aristocrats if you're thinking globally. You're able to bring to the table actual workers who's, who do not uh, wish to see the state destroyed and replaced by private power completely because the state is what built them. They are fused to it in a way that... Uh, can't be the same with the ruling elites who all imagine themselves as having emerged first and for the state to have been imposed upon them. Now, at, at, the, at the base level, it's meaningless distinction. But psychologically and culturally and socially, it's very important. So like you've got, for example, these uh, local extraction capitalists in America, the, the, the small bourgeois of the big bourgeois. 
the beautiful boners, whatever you want to call them, you know, from the Koch brothers and the Teals at the top to uh, to skilled electricians with mortgages at the bottom, if you want to be totally uh, uh, open with it. But of course, not equally powerful, not equally accessible to direct energy, which is why talking about them as one group is kind of dumb and it just becomes a question of like moral, ob moral uh, obloquy, like, oh, you're bad because you're part of this coalition. Right, but at a certain level, you're just talking about people who are rooting for a team. Like, oh, they might vote, and that might contribute to something in an aggregate, but individually, individually, they have uh, as much moral power as, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the sports fans. Especially compared to the other members of this broad coalition who actually are able to pick and choose who gets to suck and serve in office. That's way more powerful. And those people are big capitalists. They are not just petty bourgeois or homeowners or boat owners. And they all recognize the doom state that we're in. Like liberals are really hamstrung politically because their, their legitimacy resist, ro resides in maintaining a kayfabe of a functioning state. The Republicans have a big advantage in that they get to point out that the thing is falling apart. Problem is, from like a objective perspective, they literally want to make everything worse. All the things that are making it bad, they want to uh, exacerbate. But they don't know that because they their class understanding is through the screen of their personal identities. Their, and that is why their politics are identity politics, even though that's what they claim to hate most in the world. And that is competes, elites competing for what they think is staying in their position, maintaining their power, because they see in one way or another a threat to it. But none of them are able to uh, actually effectively do it. Look at the libs. The libs believe that these other guys are going to destroy fucking planet, that they're going to destroy uh, the American uh, government. And they're not really wrong about that. They are like objectively opposed to the continuance of democracy as we practice it in America. That cannot be denied. Whether they can actually do that independently is the real question. But they think it's real. They hold positions of power in political parties. They write checks to political parties. And they can't do anything effectively to stop it. They cannot even eff effectively challenge them at the ballot box. Even though demographically they are the government, they are the natural party of government in the United States. And yeah, like they are heightening the contradictions. The working class isn't heightening anything. I mean, people are doing it at their workplace, but there is still no cult, cult, there is no cultural or political uh, machinery structure on top of that energy that struggle. Yet it's being built in our in, as we say, as we speak, and all of us have have a, have a oh, we all owe it to ourselves to contribute to it any way we can. But you know, really, materially, and if we can't, expect, you know. Find something else, but find, figure it out. Oh, God, I hate prescribing. You can't prescribe. Can't prescribe. Can't prescribe brain aneurysm. But I'm not saying it doesn't, it, it, um, it won't exist, but right now it isn't there, which is why all we have is this, uh, this one-sided class, uh, this one-sided uh, mobilization against a failed liberal political consensus and constitutional order. But they lack cohesion too, which is what undermines their power and their ability to exercise their will. They're all trying to sell each other MLMs. They're all trying to pick each other's pocket. Look at fucking Bannon. Him and those guys, they want to fucking save America from the Chinese or whatever the fuck they think it is, uh, from the bug world. And, and, he, and they're stealing millions of dollars from their own supporters. 
with some fraudulent idea of buying the wall and building it yourself? An impossibility? That's why it's so fascinating because you have a total awareness of the uh, bankruptcy of the moment, but out without any constructive response. Now we all have individually, I think, correct readings of the situation, but we cannot structurally reproduce our action along our understanding of it. That's why I'm definitely thinking that after this book, we'll take another little break, but then I want to read one on China. Somebody gave me a good recommendation on a book about China, the rise of modern China, uh, and where, where, where their governance is at specifically right now. I would like to know. It's very, it's, it's definitely a black hole for me. I mean, look at the, the Democratic Party's uh, gynocracy, the fact that it's all 90-year-olds. This is a perfect example of this. No institution that had people within it operating on a consensual understanding of what is best for the organization would allow that to happen. And it wouldn't be hard to prevent. It would not be hard to prevent that from happening. All you need to do is clip seniority a little bit. All you need to do is Get enough people together when a challenger, when somebody seems like everyone understands, okay, this person's a little too old, they've lost their fastball. We can all agree that they're going to go, and then you just present it to them as a fait accompli, and they got to go. They have no choice. But everybody is a siloed little political entrepreneur. So no one can organize shit. And so they just keep winning elections. Because they've structured it so that in most of these safe seats, an incumbent can't be defeated. So the voters are never going to notice that they're a billion years old. And you can't, as a party, edit them out. That means you have no control over anything. Which is why I just can't understand anybody who's like still clinging to it. the idea that the Democratic Party... Can, can, can represent anybody's aspirations for resistance or uh, countervailing force. All right, guys, gals, that was it. Next week, we're going to dive across the span of time and across the Atlantic to the new hegemon, the decline, the, the current, the, the once and future and non-forever king, the American state, good old U.S. of A. And I think we'll just do one chapter each for this last section. Oh. Yeah. We'll see. Because I think these are uh, like individual articles, basically. I should raid Hassan. What? He, would they, they would not notice. How could they, any would notice? It's a fucking raging torrent over there. Does he actually read that chat? Is he able to do that? If he can, that's amazing. That's skill. Oh, 
Oh my God, everybody's always asking what the book is. This is the book. First Class Passengers on a Sinking Ship. Richard Lackman. All right, I'm out of here, chumps and chumpettes.